All right, ladies and gentlemen, 10 o'clock. Welcome back to Mechanics and Materials. Okay. Also known as your favorite class. Very good. All right. It's just like you will be convinced that this is your favorite class by the end of the quarter. Rawr! I'll just keep saying it and then it will be true magically. That's how politics works too. Okay. Just keep saying it. People will believe it. All right. Uh, right. Announcements. Uh, if you're in the Thursday lab section, your rough draft for your combined loading lab is due right now. Okay. So get it in. If you haven't, if you haven't, what are you doing? It should be in. All right. Also, I've posted a new homework, which is on stress transformations. Uh, it will be due on Monday. And we're going to finish up 2D stress transformations today. And that's what the homework's on. So um, you should be able to do the homework after today's lecture. So you got five days to get it done. If you have questions or problems with the homework, come to my office hours every single day, 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. I'm there, lonely. Please come visit me, okay? Let me see your faces. None of this bank robber bull crap, okay? Let me see your faces. Okay, so I hope everyone appreciates my joke today. Some people uh, don't get it, and that's because you failed physics. All right, so if this sticker is blue, then you are driving too fast. This is the Doppler effect. Okay. If you're moving too quickly towards an object, you're going to shift what wavelength appears as that object from red to blue. It's called a blue shift. If you're traveling in the opposite direction, it'd be a red shift. So the bumper sticker, if you're going the other direction, even more red. Okay. Uh, right. So there you go. Physics joke. Yay, we all like physics. Okay. Let's do some dang mechanics. All right, last we left off, we were talking about stress transformations, and we'll just review quickly. Specifically uh, 2D for now. We're going to get to 3D. Don't you worry, that is coming today. All right. So remember we had stress transformations from one coordinate system to another. If we have a 2D element in plane stress, you would have something that looks like this, your favorite thing from 2004. All right, where we have your shear stress tau x, y. Normal stress sigma x, normal stress sigma y, balanced on the backside. And we have our coordinate system here that's xy. And if we wanted to transform to another coordinate system that we called n and t, here's n, here's t, and there's an angle that exists that is this counterclockwise angle theta. Then we said that you could transform from known values that you have, sigma x, sigma y, tau xy, and that value of theta to determine what the normal stress is uh, in the n direction or what the shear stress is in the nt axes with the following transformations. And I'll just do the single angle formula here. Said that the normal stress on sort of a cut face that would point in the n direction, or if we wanted to sort of show that, that would be something like this, where here's like your n axis, all right? So the normal stress on that cut face there, that red cut through, would be sigma x times cosine squared theta plus sigma y sine squared theta plus 2 tau xy sine theta times cosine theta. Similar idea if you wanted the shear stress on that cut face in the nt axis, so on the n face in the t direction. Remember, that's how we denote these subscripts for this year. You're going to have something that looks like negative quantity sigma x minus sigma y times sine theta cosine theta. All right, plus tau xy quantity cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. All right, got to readjust a little bit here. So these are our two stress transformation equations to go from arbitrary stresses that we might know in XY coordinate system to some other alternative coordinate system aligned at an N and T direction. 
All right. So we then saw that, all right, well, both of these guys are functions of theta. So then the question is, what value of theta maximizes and minimizes those various values? All right. So if you have some function of some variable and you want to know what of that variable makes that function minimum or maximum, you get the to the calculus book and set the derivative of that function with respect to that variable equal to zero to figure out what value of that variable makes that function maximum or minimum. Okay. So we can do this for both of these and it turns out that the max and min normal stresses, we call the principal stresses. And we have an equation that we derived by taking the derivative, setting it equal to zero, then plugging that value of theta back into the transformation equation. And those principal stresses are given by the following equation, which you probably saw in your 2004 class. That is the principal stress, which we label as sigma one or two for the max and the min, is gonna be sigma x plus sigma y on two, plus or minus tau max, is your general equation. Where tau max is given by the square root of the quantity sigma x minus sigma y on two squared plus tau x y squared. All right. So this is about where we left off last time. So let's do an example problem now where we're actually using these and showing all of the cool things that you can do by transforming the stress states on various two dimensional elements. Then after our example problem, we're gonna do this in 3D. Yes. All right. So onward, new material. All right. So here's our example. This is in the, the lecture slides. So I'll give you a minute or so to copy down. Are you actually in the meeting back there? Like, are you in the team's meeting? <laughs> is there like an echo? <laughs> okay. How delayed is it? Like from when I do it to when you see it, how long does it take? Give me a, an analytical quantity in seconds. Ready? Three, two, one, go. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Let's just say five seconds. <laughs> five second delay. So the people in the classroom, the people in the classroom are getting their education five seconds before all of you online. Doesn't that make you mad? Doesn't that want you make you want to come in person and come see me? All right. 
Hopefully, after all my rambling, you've had enough time to copy. Everyone except Joe. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to copy that picture over into the notes. And we'll remind you what we're looking for. One, find sigma one, two, and tau max. Two, we're going to find the principal rotation angles, called theta p. Three, we're going to find the rotation angles to get us into principal shear stress or max shear stress. And then four, we want to sketch in principal coordinates. All right. Oh, sorry. Is it just because it's easier to read when it's on your screen back there? Yeah, OK. Makes sense. <laughs> They're smarter than you by five seconds. <laughs> That would imply that intelligence is a measure of how much information you you know, which you know may or may not be true. Is it intelligence how much you know or your capacity to learn? Ooh, good question. Find out next time on the next installment of ME three thousand five. All right, so let's go through this. Here we have this element in x y coordinates. Let's define some things that we know about this particular element, and we know some of the stresses that already exist. So let's put some some numbers to this. My stress normal face on the x direction. What value someone in the audience? Ten thousand psi. I'm going to work in ksi. So here, ten ksi. Stress in the y direction. Someone else in the audience. Minus 8,000 PSI. Good job. So we'll say minus 8 KSI. And my shear stress, this is the tough one. Someone else in the audience. We got, I got four possible people to answer. Jordan says positive. Anyone disagree? We have some disagreement. OK. Ready? Battle. Just kidding. <laughs> right. So we have 4,000 psi here. This is on the positive x face in the negative y direction. So this is going to be a negative value. Negative 4 ksi. It's on the positive x face. Here's generally the positive x face. It's in the negative y direction. So very good. All right. So these are the pieces of information we know. So let us move towards. Uh, achieving goal number one, which is calculating the principal stresses and the maximum shear stress. I'm going to do the maximum shear stress first because the maximum shear stress is used in the calculation of the principal stresses. Make sense? Makes sense. Okay. So let me uh, move down here a little bit and I will do tau max first. All right. So here the maximum shear stress is going to be square root of the quantity that is sigma x. Uh, minus sigma y on 2, all squared, plus tau xy squared. All right, I'm working in KSI. I'm not going to show the units here. I'll, I'll kind of write the unit at the end. But here in KSI, this is going to be 10 plus 8 on 2 squared, plus my tau xy quantity squared. So this is negative 4 squared. In my units here, KSI. So if you push this in, you're going to have a tau max value, which is equal to 9.85 KSI. OK, so this is one of our answers. It's the maximum shear stress that we could possibly experience on this element. All right. All right, now for our principal stresses, sigma 1 and 2. This is just simply going to be sigma x plus 
sigma y on two, plus or minus tau max. So here for us, sigma x, it's again gonna be 10. And we have plus sigma y, but sigma y is negative eight. So I'll write minus eight on two. So plus or minus tau max, which is 9.85 KSI. So we get two principal stresses out of this. We typically have sigma one as the greater of the two. So sigma one always greater than sigma two, just kind of by convention. So here's sigma one, I'll take the plus 9.85 and 10 minus eight is two divided by two is one. One plus 9.85 is 10.85, yes. KSI, and then one minus 9.85 will give me a negative 8.85 KSI. All right, so here we are. These are our principal stresses and our maximum shear stress. Onwards. Next, we're gonna look at what are the rotation angles required for our element to go from its current configuration into the configuration of maximum principal stresses or into maximum shear stress, okay? So here I'll, I'll say, you know, here we're kind of moving towards number two on our list. And to find these principal rotation angles, again, remember how we did this originally, take the derivative of our stress transformation function, set it to zero, and then the value of theta, which, you know, sort of fits that um, zero slope will be our principal rotation angle. We had an equation that helped us define this, and that equation is tangent of two theta p is equal to two times tau xy divided by sigma x minus sigma y. All right. I think I wrote it in terms of theta maybe last time, but um, this was part of it along, along the way. So here we have two times tau xy, which is negative four, uh, KSI, if you'd like, divided by sigma x minus sigma y. This is 10 plus 8 KSI. Okay. That means that tangent of 2 theta p is equal to negative 8 on 18. So you can plug this into a calculator if you'd like, and theta p. Again, we're going to have two values for theta p on the domain uh, 0 to 360. And so we'll have, well, actually, on, on, I'll work on the domain negative 180 to positive 180. It's more appropriate. Negative 12 degrees, 12 degrees, and 78 degrees. Right. So those are the rotation angles that would get you into principal coordinates. We'll draw a picture of this in, in just a second, but let me do the rotation angles for maximum shear. All right, so kind of towards number three here, let's find your maximum shear stress, sigma tau, or theta tau. We had a, a similar looking equation, which is tangent of two theta tau equal to slightly different here now when we take the derivative of the shear stress equation you're going to have negative quantity sigma x minus sigma y divided by 2 tau xy okay for us here this is negative 10 plus 8 divided by 2 times negative 4 both of these in KSI, but the KSI is going to cancel. And so you'll end up here with negative 18 over negative 8, which is 18 over 8. Again, into the calculator, 
you'll get your rotation angle for your element to get into maximum shear stress coordinates, which is going to be 38 degrees, 38, 33, or 57 degrees. OK, so what do these rotation angles actually represent? Well, we can sort of draw a sketch of this to sort of understand. And I'm going to draw the original element and the rotated element, just so you sort of see the general stresses and the stress states. So let's uh, let's make a sketch. And we're going to draw a principal. orientation and we'll rotate by theta equals negative 12 degrees. It is kind of the first one listed here this is my principal rotation angle. So original element. will look something like this. It's kind of the uh, original piece that we had. And I'm going to again draw these stresses that we had on it. In this direction, we have 8 KSI. To the right, we had 10 KSI. Equal on the backside. And then we also had a shear stress on the positive x face in the negative direction. Which is 4 KSI. Maybe I'll draw that up here just because I need some space. Now this was in sort of like a x y coordinate system. So I could sort of draw that here. Sort of in the middle of my element. Now, if I want to draw a new element that is rotated negative 12 degrees from this, I want a coordinate system that's sort of rotated negative 12 degrees away from this. Now, I could draw that right on that element, but it would get a little bit busy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the coordinate system in a different point of space and, um, and, and show all the stresses on that particular element. And so I would understand that I might want to rotate 12 degrees from this current axis. And so 12 degrees from this current axis might look something like that. And so I'm just going to draw this line that's at negative 12 degrees from that axis. And sort of establish a new point in space here that has kind of that coordinate system. So here is N, here is T. All right. And my new element will be sort of centered in that coordinate system. All right. So here, this is like negative 12 degrees. So I'll just draw this as 12 degrees. And my new element will be a square with um, perpendicular edges to this coordinate system. OK, so here's sort of like a rotated element. I could try to fit that on the element that already exists, but it would get a little bit busy. So I'm just going to kind of like displace it slightly from the original location. Right. So this configuration, I'm in kind of my um, principal stress orientation. And we've calculated what the principal stresses are. And so I can just kind of put them on here directly. So in this general direction, I have what would be 10.85 KSI. And on the top here, I have the other principal stress, which is negative 8.85 KSI. And one you know, quality of principal stress elements is they contain no shear. OK, 
so so there you go. There's your sketch of um, an element in principal orientation. Questions from the folks in the audience. OK, one theoretical question I have for all of you. I calculated two principal stresses, 10.85 and negative 8.85. How did I know to draw the 10.85 on this side and the negative 8.85 on this side instead of the other way around? How might I check that? So the question is, is it because I'm keeping the sign convention of the original element? That would be a good indication, but let's say that you have positive stresses on both sides. Then what do you do? Right. OK. I've kind of done this by intuition. You can see that I haven't rotated much, and 10 KSI is very close to 10.85 KSI, so that's like a good indicator. But if I didn't know for sure, the way that I could check is I could plug my value of theta that I used for my rotation into my stress transformation equations to determine what stress value exists along sigma n. What do I mean by that? So if unsure, which value of sigma 1 or sigma 2 goes along n axis, plug theta p into your equation for the normal stress. If I plug theta p into sigma n, what am I going to get? If I plug the principal rotation angle into my stress transformation equation for sigma n, what, what should I obtain? What, what better I obtain? The crickets are chirping. What is theta p? It's the value of theta that will maximize or minimize my stress, right? So if I plug theta p into the stress transformation equation, my sigma n better be either sigma 1 or sigma 2. Let's demonstrate that. Right. Remember that my stress transformation equation is something like sigma x plus sigma y. This is the double angle version over 2 plus sigma x minus sigma y over 2 times cosine 2 theta plus tau xy. Sine 2 theta. Use theta equals the principal rotation angle, which here is negative 12 degrees. Okay. I better get sigma 1 or sigma 2 out of this, right? Otherwise, I done messed up. All right. Sigma x and sigma y, these are known. It's 10 minus 8 over 2 plus. 10 plus 8 over 2 cosine negative 24 degrees minus 4 times sine negative 24 degrees. Punch each of these into a calculator or do mental math on that first term. 10 minus 8, 2 on 2 is 1. So here I'll have 1. The second term, if you plug it into a calculator, you'll get 8.22. This third term, you plug it in on a calculator, 1.63. And you'll find that this after transformation is 10.85, which does in fact equal sigma 1. 
Okay. So if you need to check yourself on which principal stress value goes along the n direction, which principal stress value goes along the t direction, this is the way that you do it. All right. Plug your rotation angle back into this stress transformation equation and, and you do it that way. Capish? Capish? All right, I'm getting some thumbs up and some sleepy eyeballs. Okay. 50 50. All right, so that sort of concludes the 2D portion of stress transformations in principal stresses. We will now move on to the new set of notes, which I posted on Blackboard. And that's going to be on three dimensional stress states, 3D stress transformations, and 3D principal stresses. Whew, I'm scared. You guys scared? I'm scared. Dang. All right. So now, 3D stress at a point. All right. Now your 2D element was kind of this square element, and we just assumed that there was no stress kind of in the third dimension. All right, we're in a state of plane stress, right? So recall, in 2D, you had this kind of element going on. Right. Something like sigma x, sigma y, and tau x, y. This was plane stress. This was one side of our stress cube, remember? And we could cut this. To get something that looked like this. Here. Where we still have. our stress values on this element. But now because we've created a new face, we have this normal stress coming off and the shear stress, which is on the normal face in the T direction. Right. So we derived an equation for sigma n and tau nt. by assuming that we're in static equilibrium in the two directions. Yes? We are going to do the same thing, but not with the two-dimensional element. Now we're going to do it with the three-dimensional element. Okay? So buckle in. If you've watched Spaceballs, what do you want to tell me right now? Ah, uh, buckle this. Okay. <laughs> Ludicrous speed, go. <laughs> All right. Same idea in 3D. We have our 3D stress cube, which we can draw. Here. Okay. And on this guy, we have stresses. So here I'll draw stresses just as a reminder. Our normal stresses. We have our shear stresses.
And what we're going to do is we're going to slice through this cube. And I'm going to draw the slice on a new cube because my first one's a little bit busy. I'm going to slice through this guy. And when I do, I'm going to cut through at kind of like an oblique angle. The angle that I cut through is not really going to be, you know, specified. It's going to be like an arbitrary cut. And so I'm just going to draw this as kind of like a, this like triangular looking slice between kind of the edges of this cube, right? So I just like lopped off one half by basically chopping through the diagonal. Okay, so this is the cut. Through. All right, give you a second with that. And so after I lop off like that half of that cube, you'll see what looks like this. And remember that there's like the back side of the cube here. It sort of exists. All right, that back half still exists. All right. So now the stresses on this. I still retain all the stresses that are on the back side of that cube. Okay. Just like when I cut through that 2D element. I still retained all the stresses that were sort of on the left and bottom sides of that 2D element. So I still have kind of like on the back side, if you can sort of like imagine the back side here, I still what has I still have this like sigma y on the back side. All right. In the back side here in this x direction, I still have like the sigma x on the back side. And I still have like the sigma z kind of on the bottom side here. Okay, those are on kind of like the back faces there. I similarly have the shear stresses that still exist on that back face. Okay, I'm going to try to draw them as best I can, but here's kind of like the shear stresses that exist. I'm not going to label them all just because I'm kind of out of room. But those shear stresses still exist on the back face, right? The difference is now that I have this sliced surface that will have a normal stress and shear stress components on that sliced face, right? So now on this sliced face here, I have a normal stress that comes off this sliced face. It is sigma n. I also have shear stresses on this sliced face. Let's call this tau n t1. And I also have, this is getting a little busy, I understand, but it is what it is. Here's tau n t2. Two shear stresses, one in one direction, one in the other, right? On the n face in the t1 direction, on the n face in the t2 direction. Michael Bay approved. Did he do Terminator 2? It was Michael Bay or someone else? How about we'll just say Arnold Schwarzenegger approved. I don't think Michael Bay did Terminator, did he? I think he came later. He did like Transformers and stuff. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Who did Terminator? Someone in the chat, like look it up in T2. James Cameron. Yes, Ah, I win. Okay. <laughs> okay, so these are my stresses after the cut. It will also be helpful for me to define a geometry after the cut. So let's draw our triangle again and put some geometries on this. James Cameron, yes, also did 
my favorite Leonardo DiCaprio movie, which is Titanic. Very good. <laughs> there is definitely enough space on that door. Let's be real. <laughs> okay. So here's the geometry. When we create this new slice, we're going to have a normal that's coming off of that surface. All right. So here is my base of my X, Y, Z coordinates. And I have now piercing through this plane some axis that's coming through that is like the N axis. Okay. And I will also additionally have two tangential axes that are 90 degrees with that. Okay. And rather arbitrary on the surface, but let's just say, okay, here is T1 and here is T2. All right. Both on this sort of like oblique surface, 90 degrees from each other. Right? So I have an NT1 plane, I have an NT2 plane, and I have a T1, T2 plane, which is sort of the, the slice that I made. Now, the geometry here, we have to, to focus a little bit. This normal, N, has angles that it makes with the X, Y, and the Z axes, which we can define. So the angles that exist here, between like the Y axis and the N axis, we might label as like theta Y. Okay. Between the N axis and the X axis, we have some angle that we might label as sigma X, sorry, theta X. And we have an angle that exists between N and Z. The angle here is theta Z. You have seen this before or something like this before in your statics class, 2001. And we can use the angles between some arbitrary vector, this N unit vector, and the X, Y, and the Z. We can create what are called direction cosines. So the direction cosines can be defined using theta X, theta Y, and theta Z. So we have direction cosines. Which is like L is cosine theta x. Script M is cosine theta y. Script N is cosine theta z. You guys have seen this before, direction cosines? I hope, yes. Jordan, you took statics with me. I know you know. Okay. What if I did L squared plus M squared plus N squared? What do I get? It's the loneliest number. One. Good. So the sum of the squares of the directional cosines has to be one. Good. So why do I define these directional cosines? Well, that's because... The way that we're going to sort of derive the equation for the normal stress in 3D is the same method that we did to derive the stress in 2D. So what I'm ultimately after is I want an equation for, let's say, sigma n. In terms of stress components. and directional cosines. All things that are assumed to be known, okay? So just like I did in 2D, I sliced through that square. I had an angle of theta, which was like theta x, okay? That allowed me to define that normal. I had stress elements that I knew, sigma x, sigma y, tau x, y, and I derived an equation for sigma n. So how did I derive that equation for sigma n? How did I derive the stress transformation equation in 2D? I think someone in the chat may have it. Produced and directed by James Cameron. Okay, they did have it. Okay, thanks, Alex. 
So if I want the normal stress in terms of the stresses on my cube and those angles, some forces in n direction. And set to zero. In math language, some of the forces in n is zero. And we will do this next time. Yes. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for coming. We will sum the forces in the n direction on this sliced 3D cube when we return. Yeah, this is like one of my like this is like one of my favorite things. You like take this 3D stress element, this stress, you slice it, you sum the forces in the n in this three dimensions. You get the equation for stress transformation in three dimensions with direction cosine. Take the gradient to determine where that's maximum. Man, this is like great stuff. Great stuff. I'm telling you. Almost as good as space balls. Almost. The worst part about giving lectures is I don't have coffee. I need my Mr. Coffee when I give my Mr. Lectures. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if the school would let me or not, but I don't think it's very sanitary to be like, you know, drinking a bunch of stuff in class. You know, I have my Mr. Coffee with my Mr. Lecture. <laughs> Was that fre was freshman year for you? Yeah. Slurp it through a straw. Good idea, Alan. If you get me a mask with a straw, I'm in. Maybe I'll get like one of those flexible straws. I can like, you know, get it in behind my mask or something. <laughs> Our, I remember in the derping, you had a giant vase of it. I meant to be spring. My uh, bad. The, Not a great typer. The spring was kind of a derp, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could get one of those um, stadium helmet hat things that they put beer in. 